Did everybody here receive a packet as you came in? You should have uh, received a packet at the uh, table out there, and you'll see in the packet there is a notepad, there is a pen and a highlighter, so you guys can use that to take notes tonight. You can use it to mark up your beloved books as uh, you continue to read them. And uh, also in that packet, uh, there are two um, packets. <laughs> One is uh, more supplemental material that has to do with our first course, which is a course on practical Christian living. And um, it's on this, of course, the beloved book. And the first packet really deals with the themes that we're covering tonight. It deals with the themes of the love of God. So there we have scripture verses for you to meditate on. We have quotes from uh, men and women throughout the last 20 centuries of the church, what they've said on the love of God, just things for you to contemplate, to think over. And this is just supplement material. I know not all of you may uh, read it, but for those who want to take time to contemplate, to read, to understand, uh, we just want to give everything in your hands, give you tools that you can use in your tool basket. So you'll receive a, a little packet each month as you come out that has to do with the themes of the lectures during that night. And also, uh, you, you should have received another little packet in there called The Parable of the Dancing God. You see that one? Uh, by a man uh, named Baxter Kruger. And you'll see uh, that it all has to do with the parable that Jesus gave in Luke 15, which most of us know as the parable of the prodigal son, right? That's how we're usually familiar with that story. You'll see tonight, or in the beloved book, if you read the first three chapters, that we call uh, that story the parable of the lost boys and the searching father. Because really the parable isn't just about one son, right? It's about two boys. And so, and really the focus isn't on the boy. The focus is on the goodness of our father. And that's really what we're going to be talking about tonight. Baxter Kruger, he does a wonderful job just bringing out the themes of that parable. So it's really a mini booklet. Um, that we've included for you. I know if you take time to read it, uh, you will really enjoy it, and uh, it will help you root and ground your heart and your life in the immeasurable love of God. And that's what we need to do if we're going to live uh, Christian lives and have Christian morals uh, that are good. Um, it all has to be rooted and grounded in the magnificent love of God. So one thing before we uh, begin our first lecture that I just want to say is this. I want to say um, I like a story that one of my friends, Fred, tells. Um, he was invited to dinner one time to some friend's house who were Jewish, and they gave him a great, wonderful feast. And during the course of the meal, they asked him, well, why don't you explain to me a little bit about what you believe about God, right? The subject turned to religion. And Fred he recounts how he remembers just feeling so ashamed because he really couldn't explain to his friends what he believed about God or what he believed about the Christian faith. And so he says that he went home that night and he made a commitment to himself that he was going to understand what the gospel is about, that he was going to understand what the scriptures teach, and that he would never be put in a situation again where he couldn't feel like he could give an answer for the hope that he held. And that's really what 1 Peter 3.15 says. I just want to pull that up there. It says this. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. And so really that's... What we want to do is you guys have decided to come uh, to this school once a month is it's just equipping you uh, to always have an answer for the hope that is in you. And that hope is grounded in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I think as you meditate on these truths these next three months as we go through this first course, it really will uh, make you stable. And the second thing I just want to mention is this, is that what we're dealing with in this course about the gospel is a matter of first importance. You know, Christianity has a lot to do with a lot of things. The Bible talks about a lot of stuff. And um, 
but there are matters of first importance and there are matters of second importance. Paul put it this way to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. So what's of first importance is the gospel. And all scripture and doctrine is important. But it all must flow from a correct understanding of what is of first importance. And that is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was raised from the dead for our justification. So really that's what these next three months are going to all be about. They're going to be about that gospel. And so how, how many of you did do some of the readings in the book? The first three chapters, great. And so really these lectures tonight, they will be covering that first three chapters. I want to give you, um, for those who had the form and you know what we're doing in a month from now, is the lectures will cover the next four chapters of the book. So chapters four, five, six, and seven. And then also uh, for those who want to do the scripture readings, um, we will give you more information on this, but you can read 2 Samuel 9. The book of Colossians, Colossians 1 through 4, and Hebrews 8 through 10. But um, I just want to take this time now to invite my father up, Keith Hershey, and he will be delivering the first lecture of the night that will be taken from chapter 1 of Beloved. Thank you. Wonderful. Good evening. And welcome, of course, uh, to Grace Life Bible School. I'm really, really honored uh, not only to share here in this uh, first lesson of this first class, but I'm just excited that all of our hearts can uh, really be thrilled with the, with the truth of the gospel and make sure it's uh, the foundation and the framework of all of our thinking, that uh, anything that we're thinking and sharing about uh, always be filtered through the wonderful love of God that's in Christ Jesus. So this first class... Uh, is really titled, God Loves Us Before We Love Him. God loves us before we love him. And, of course, our text for uh, the course is a book, Beloved or Beloved. And uh, this is uh, just learning to enjoy the place where you belong. You may say, Keith, that's kind of a strange uh, uh, title for the first class, God Loves Us Before We Love Him. Well, the reason... We say that is because in Christendom of all kinds that many times the paradigm is shifted. In other words, for many, many years uh, when I went to Sunday school as a little child in the Midwest and growing up and went to university, went to Bible colleges, went to, uh, went to seminary. But uh, my understanding of what was always taught me was always my focus on loving him. And uh, nobody really ever taught me how to be loved. And so I lived many, many, many years of my life and worked many, many years in the ministry, always feeling somewhat condemned and always measuring myself incorrectly because I never felt I did a very good job at loving God. Has, has any of you ever felt that way? In other words, we get uh, comparing, we get feeling uh, very uh, uh, condemned about our, our, our life or our walk or our, our, our lifestyle, our failures in the flesh. And uh, I always thought, well, I just don't love God enough, or I just don't love God good enough. And so, uh, you know, God delivered me from me and got my eyes off myself and my focus of loving him and put my eyes on him in understanding his love for me. This, to me, being loved or knowing your place in the beloved, you see your whole world differently. What I mean by that is uh, most of us only see ourselves or know ourselves according to our natural life, our flesh. And uh, if we know ourselves according to the flesh, most times we don't like ourselves. You know, we have ups and downs. We're happy with ourselves one day. Then we're disgusted with ourselves by noon because we only know ourselves according to, the, to, 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 our, to our humanness. But God wants us to know ourselves according to Christ and according to the cross. And so being loved is understanding that God's view of you is not you. That God's view of you is in him or in 
the beloved. It's captured in the beloved. And this is something that you don't have to do on your own. This is something he does on your behalf. You believe it and find yourself in a whole different arena, a whole different world. Actually, it's a whole different kingdom. It's a whole different way of living. So to me, this is one of the most important truths for your spiritual life. And uh, this is something I focus on constantly in my, my life and my world. And I think if this is not understood correctly by a believer, you're always going to uh, live your life striving and always feeling somewhat disappointed about yourself before the Father. And to be honest with you, you're going to live a little bit fear-filled about your future before the Father because you're going to think it's all up to you. And that's a very, very disappointing way to live. So the gospel gives you a deliverance into the love of the Father that's thrilling. And the beautiful thing about being loved, it triggers you to love the Father. In other words, my love for God now is a reciprocal. My love for God is not a primary thought. It's a secondary thought that's triggered by his love for me. And so my ministry now, one to another, the way I can move uh, in compassion toward people, in love toward people when I, when I don't want to, is always just being filled with the love of the Father because it gives me a position of grace and mercy to extend toward others. So like I say, to me it's the most important truth uh, for our spiritual life that God loves us completely. And this is what I say all the time, and really this is what the book of love is about. God loves you completely. I like to say there's no disappointment in God concerning you. And when you tell that to most people, it makes them kind of stutter and shudder and say, they say, say what, you know? There is no disappointment in the Father concerning you because he sees you in, in the Lamb, in the love of the Lamb, or in Christ Jesus. And it's a beautiful thing. So God loves you completely. It reminds me of a story I heard a long time ago about a famous theologian who was just brilliant, wrote all kinds of textbooks and different things. And uh, he was uh, fading quite quickly. It was the end of his season in the earth. He was an elderly man. And some of uh, these scholars gathered around him to, you know, uh, his bed and just asked him, you know, what, what, what is the greatest, you know, revelation of all this theology and everything? And, you know, the, the thing he came up with was that Jesus loves me. This I know. And uh, I think this is something that has to anchor in our soul so much that we are accepted in the beloved that God loves us completely. God's got nothing on us. He put everything wrong with us on the Lamb of God. He took it all. Aren't you glad? And all of us have been eternally redeemed. So we are accepted in the beloved. Here's what the scripture says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. It says, for we love him because he first loved us. So again, the focus of Christianity is really not loving God. Now that may make a lot of people mad with the semantics or the words that I use, but let me say it again. The focus of Christianity isn't trying to rev people up to get them fired up to love God. The focus to me is revealing to them God's great love for them in Christ to show them who they are before the Father. And it has nothing to do with them, but has everything to do with the one who's made them righteous. And when we receive this kind of love, then our lifestyle can be lived loving God and loving one another. So again, we love him because he first loved us. Look at it says in Ephesians 1 verse 6. These are Verses, friends, that are, are taught and laced throughout a lot of the materials that you have. But these are things that you can really think on and meditate on, you know, daily and have this anchored deep into your soul. It says in verse 6 of Ephesians 1, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted. He made us accepted in the beloved. And this to me is what's really, really important to understand and know that we have been accepted in the beloved. And this is what the Father has done. He made us accepted in the beloved. This is good news. And then the next verse, verse 7, says this. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So all this happens by the grace of God. So let's pause right here for a moment because when we talk about being accepted in the beloved, it has nothing to do with us. It has something to do that he did for us. And it says in the next verse, it's all by grace. 
He did through the riches of his grace. So when we use the term grace, at least when I'm teaching in different lectures that I'm doing, I'm, I'm teaching grace in terms of just strictly the unmerited favor of the Father toward us that we gain access to in Christ Jesus. The unmerited favor of the Father toward us that we gain access to in Christ Jesus. In other words, there's no merit to it. It's an unmerited favor. And this is what's hard for most people to understand about Christendom because a lot of times people say, yeah, God loves you, but they don't really believe God loves you completely. They really don't really believe that. They, they believe God still has a list of, and, and, and is getting ready in some way to bring judgment upon them if there's a misstep in some way. And we have a father who's done a perfect work through Christ on our behalf, and uh, we are continually uh, forgiven, and we are continually accepted according to the riches of his grace. So in this first lecture, the first point that we want to talk about is this. The gospel is announced prior to the faith of those to whom it's announced. In other words, the gospel is given, so faith is present. You know, the gospel gives you faith to believe. Sometimes we try to make people believe and we try to talk them into stuff. I find that the gospel presented in its simplicity and its power empowers people to say amen or say yes to the love of the Father. So the gospel has to be proclaimed or it has to be announced. It has to be declared. It has to be lived out uh, in, a, in, in a way to us prior uh, to the point where faith can arise in our hearts and we can accept the fact that we are accepted. Look at this uh, gospel announcement in Luke chapter 2. Of course, this is uh, found in Luke 2, verse 10, and 12, uh, 10 through 12. This is when, uh, you know, the shepherds were in the field uh, watching uh, their flock and that heavenly announcement came. I like to say it was like a heavenly post, uh, you know, uh, in our social media terms, it was posted in the heavens. And what God wants to do when he posts something about the Lamb of God, he just wants you to like it. He wants it to capture your heart in such a way where you say, you've got to be kidding me. And he wants you just to like it. He wants you to have believing moments in the beauty of who he is toward you so you can rest in him. And stop this life in this type of Christendom that's always striving and always disappointed with ourselves. So the Father makes a heavenly announcement through angels, and it says in Luke 2, verse 10, Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid to, the, uh, to these shepherds, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which, are, which is to all people. It's to all people. Notice this announcement. This gospel is for everyone, everywhere. And that's uh, like it's been explained before, the immeasurable love of the Father. Then verse 11, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. You know, a lot of times people's worldview of God is that he's just going to judge them. They only know God is like a bad guy in heaven just getting ready one day to throw the book at him. You know what I mean? And just, just, just grind him up, so to speak. But, but what God reveals in Christ not a judge, but a savior for everyone everywhere. And then it says in verse 12, this will be the sign to you. This will be the sign to you. You're going to find this baby Jesus wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. So God gives a heavenly post through this announcement of the angelic beings. He says a savior is born. This savior is for everyone everywhere. And the sign for you is this baby that's wrapped in swaddling clothes. Now, there's a lot of significance to that. We're not going to take time to really dip into it tonight. But, but Jesus, when the shepherds saw Jesus, he was wrapped in linen to, to give a picture, really, of that this is the baby that was born to die. This is the baby that was born to show us the demonstration of the Father's love through his death when sin would be placed upon him, the sin of the world. And he would go to the grave and be raised up. And that the trough was, was a picture of the grave. It was a stone. It was, it was cut out for the, for the uh, livestock to feed out of. And Jesus, the baby, was wrapped in linen. And when he died, they came and took his body and wrapped him in linen. And they laid him in a stone that was hewn out of a rock. So the sign is always the lamb. And that's why in our lives, uh, we have to keep our eyes on Jesus. If you're having a Christian life with your eyes on you, no wonder you're depressed. No wonder you're disappointed. 
You and I have to live a life with our eyes on Jesus and understand that our position before the Father is in Him. We are accepted in the Beloved, so I believe my only daily duty, so to speak, if that's the right word about it, is just be loved. Every day, position yourself in the reality of the sign that's posted and just say, I like it. I love it. I want some more of it. You know, whatever it is, but, but have believing moments with the beauty of what God's love is for you. There's a, there's a great quote that I want to put up here by a, a famous missionary, E. Stanley Jones. He says, if you don't see God in the face of Jesus, you see something other in God. You know, Jesus is the perfect picture of the Father. You know, Jesus made statements like, you know, uh, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus would say things like, uh, no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom he reveals him to. So this E. Stanley Jones has this great quote. If you don't see God in the face of Jesus, you see something other than God, indifferent. Jesus is the self-revelation of God. I love that phrase. God is a Jesus like God. Everybody that wants to know the God in our world, we have to show them the Lamb of God, Jesus, the Son of God. Apart from Jesus, your ideas of God become strange and uncertain. But when you lose Jesus, you lose God. The more I know of Jesus, the more I know of God. E. Stanley Jones. And I think it's very, very important. So it's important that the gospel is announced so people can have a believing moment and say, I like it. I want it. I want to follow this Savior. Point number two we want to talk about briefly in this first session tonight is that the gospel is not about you. The gospel is not about you. It's about the lamb. Now, this is important because for many, many years, I would say for several decades, when I heard the gospel, or even when I preached the gospel, many times I made it about the people. I used to always preach to people what rascals they were. What rotten, low-down, good-for-nothing folk. You know what I mean? All over the world, I would teach and preach like that because that's the role model I had. But I'm learning that the gospel is not about us. The gospel is about Jesus. The gospel is not about them. The gospel is about him. Do you know when you preach to people and tell them they're losers and that they got to be right before they're accepted, how many know that deep down in your soul, you say to yourself, I've tried that and, and I just can't fix myself? Huh? And, and so the gospel is not about you. So you don't have to go around with burdens in life, in disappointment, in life about yourself. The gospel is about Jesus and you taking your place in him. That's where there's renewal, restoration, and that's where there's deliverance. That's where there's victory. That's where there's help. That's where there's hope. But our righteousness is not based on us. Our righteousness is gifted to us based on another Jesus. So the gospel is not about you. It's about the lamb. Look at John 1 verse 29. The scripture says the next day, this is, uh, well, the, we'll just read it. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And the beautiful thing I love about the Lamb of God, the Lamb does all the work. The scripture talks about that it's through the obedience of one that we have an eternal redemption. It's not even through our obedience. It's our faith in his obedience. It's the obedience of one. But the Lamb of God did all the work from start to finish. And what the Lamb has done is, 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 is really pre-approved you before the Father. The Lamb has pre-approved me before the Father. The Lamb of God has pre-approved the world before the Father. Uh, in the Old Testament, you know, types and shadows of things. Very, very interesting. You read Leviticus. I was uh, looking at some of these chapters. Chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. They're all different uh, ideas and symbolism of, of, of offerings, sin offerings, and different type of offerings in the Old Testament. So the sinner would take a, a, a sacrifice before the priest and go as a big sinner before the priest. The priest represents the eyes of God, but the priest never judged the sinner. See, sometimes in our Christian life, we always think God's going to judge the sinner harsh and hard in all of us when we miss the mark. But in the Old Testament, the picture shows us that when the, pre, when the sinner acknowledged the sin and went with a sacrifice, that the sinner was never inspected. But the, the sacrifice was inspected. In other words, the priest would, would, would inspect the lamb 
or the, the animal that was to be sacrificed. And when the lamb was inspected and found perfect or, 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 or worthy, then the sinner was accepted. In other words, the priest, the eyes of God, never had anything demeaning to say to the sinner. The inspection is always the lamb. See, you have to understand, I have to understand that our position before the Father, our security, our peace point is not us. Our security and peace point is the lamb, the sacrifice, who did it all. God inspected Jesus and said it's good. Jesus said it's a finished work. He was inspected. I'm accepted. You're accepted in the beloved, and Jesus did it all. It reminds me of uh, when I travel a lot internationally. I, I, I fly a lot, so I, I get to, uh, you know, I, I have uh, perks. One of my perks is I, I get to go into the, the lounges for business travelers. And you just can't buy your way into a lounge. You just can't go and give, uh, say, I'll give you $500. They, they won't let you in. It's, it's, it's only for those who are qualified to be there. And I'm qualified. But if you're with me, if you're with me and I say, come on, we're going to go to a different environment, a different world. We're not going to be with all the riffraff and the noise and the chaos and all the inspections and security. We're going to go into a different environment with different music, different peace points. We're going to go into a heavenly realm. We're going into the club. You might say, I, I, I'm not good enough to get in the club. I don't have a membership. I say, just follow me. If you have faith to follow me, when we check in, they ask about me. They never ask about you. Because when I check in, all I do is say, this is my friend. He, she is with me. And they say, welcome. In other words, your acceptance to a different environment or a different world has nothing to do with you. Your acceptance to heaven's got nothing to do with you. It's got everything to do with the Lamb of God. This is why the gospel is good news. And this is why you have to daily take time to be loved. It's the only way your heart has hope. It's the only way you can understand the fullness and the beauty of what Jesus has done for you. And this is why it's so very, very important to stay anchored in his love for you. Point three, real quickly. God comes to seek and save the lost. He finds us. You know, years ago, there was a big uh, Christian campaign called I, I Found Him or I Found It or whatever it was called. You know, he finds you. You know, he, you'll see that the love of the Father is so astonishing. He, he'll, he'll, he'll leave the 90 and 9 to, to go after the one that's lost. His love for you, you can't fully calculate because it makes no human sense. I would have written myself off a long, long time ago. But it's the love of God that's kept me. It's the love of God for me that I've just been crazy enough to believe. It's beautiful. And it equips me for everything I need in life. The searching father and the lost boys, many times called the story of the prodigal son. Actually, Luke 15 talks about the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son, or really the lost sons. The oldest son was just as lost as the younger son. He was just lost religiously with a religious worldview. But look at it says about the prodigal son, verse uh, 13 of Luke 15. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. In other words, he was naughty, <laughs> or you could say it this way, he was having a good time. You know, whatever it was, he was, he was party time. You know, he was in L.A., glory, glory, hallelujah. He was having a big time, and uh, the father let him go with no, no, no really concern. You know, the Father lets you do what you need to do because his love will still meet you there, meet you in your deepest pain. goes on. We don't have time to read the whole story, but look at verse 20. It says, he arose and came to his father after he wasted all his money. But when he was still a, a great way off, the father saw him, had compassion, love. Love's always moving. The father saw him in the, in, in, and he ran. He ran. This is one place in Scripture where you see that the father can really move quickly. The father ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. I love it so very much. Look at it, it says in verse 22 through verse 24. The father said to the servants, bring out the best robe, put it on him. Bring out a ring, put it on his hand, sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's be merry. Let's, let's party. Let's, let's uh, have a big time for my son who was dead, living a lifeless life, is now alive again. He was lost and he's been found, and they began to be merry. It's very, very important that we understand this kind of radical love, and we understand he loves us, 
before we can love him. Let me share one other quote with you. This is by another missionary, a guy named Oswald Chambers. He says, what ups and downs we experience because we build not on faith but on feeling, not on the finished work of Christ but our own work uh, and endeavor and, and experience. In other words, life is full of ups and downs when we're building lives based on us or based on our righteousness. It'll lie to you every time. It'll never tell you the truth about you. The only righteousness that's good for you that gives you confidence continually is the righteousness that's gifted, and you only get that by faith. It's a righteousness which is by faith. So that concludes the first session in our class. Did you enjoy it? Great. Thanks so much. I give it back to the dean of Grace Life Bible.